all. Good to see you this morning. Let me ask you to go ahead and turn with me to Colossians, the first chapter. I'll be putting these verses on the screen a little bit later, but I really encourage you to uh, use your own Bibles and maybe make some notes in that. And also want to continue to remind you that when you come in in the uh, mornings, please look on those little tables right outside the door and pick up one of the outlines Uh, Not only because many of you will attend life groups tonight and you'll use those as a part of your discussion group, but I also want to encourage you to really take notes. Uh, That's what those outlines are for, to help us kind of focus uh, as we go through the study. But if, if you really want to get serious about your Bible study, I'd encourage you just to make a folder or a little notebook and just sort of keep all these notes and then you can go back through and uh, make a study on your own, and it'll be a a beneficial source to you. So we encourage you to do that this morning. You know, we started a month ago our series on Colossians, and I would preached two lessons, and then we took a two-week break because we celebrated graduation Sunday with our high school seniors, and then last Sunday we celebrated Mother's Day. But today we're going to return to our study in Colossians, And I want you to be ready to go in Colossians chapter 1. In case you missed one of those or both of those lessons uh, in Colossians that I preached earlier, let me briefly review the background of this particular letter. While there were many things in that congregation that Paul commended, there were also some very serious doctrinal teachings, some errors that threatened the truth of the gospel in that church and even could have destroyed that church. In particular, there were some false teachings about the nature of Jesus Christ himself. Now, let me quickly review to bring us sort of back up to speed again. One of the teachings was that in order to know God, you had to have a special mystical knowledge beyond what could have been learned from the Old Testament Scriptures and beyond the teachings of Jesus and the Apostles. So a special mystical knowledge. Number two, they taught that Jesus was a created being. You remember the idea, if you were here, of the emanations thing that emanated from God, that was created from God? And there were these levels of emanations that sort of flowed out of God. God was at the top and He was perfect. The first thing they said God created was Jesus. So in their view, Jesus was a created being, but he wasn't as perfect. He wasn't as pure as God. And then below, kind of like going down the rungs of a ladder, below Jesus, then there were like the angelic beings and continuing on down more and more beings, but each one further and further removed from God. And in essence, what that meant was is that they were denying the deity of Jesus. A third thing they taught was that all created matter was evil, including the human body. And so, if they believed that the human body was evil, then certainly God could not have inhabited a human body. And therefore, they again denied that Jesus or that the Son of God could possibly have come in the flesh. That was a a real problem in the first century, the latter first part of the first century. Even John deals with that over in 1 John. Uh, They also taught that there there was a powerful spirit world out there that uh, created the material things of this world, and they used those things to attack mankind. Uh, Paul talks later in this epistle about powers and authorities and principalities. Well, that's probably what he's referring to. They also taught a form of astrology. You may have thought that astrology is a fairly recent phenomenon. You know, you know your your horoscope, your sign. But they taught a type of astrology back then, believing that these angelic beings actually ruled over the heavenly bodies and that those things affected human beings here on the earth. And then finally, one of the major teachings that they had was a legalism that was tied with their Jewish background where they tried to impose these rigid rules 
uh, and stringent ceremonies and regulations upon the people if they were going to please God. Now, you take all those things together like separate ingredients and you put them in a big pot and you stir it all together, you come up with a big soup of false doctrine. And it was a real mess in that church. The most dangerous thing of all about what was being taught there is that it denied Jesus his place of preeminence and his place of supremacy. They did not deny that Jesus existed. As a matter of fact, they would have taught an appreciation for Jesus. But by denying that Jesus came in the flesh, and by denying that Jesus was the divine Son of God, they were saying in essence, Jesus is not enough. They were saying that you need something more than Jesus if you're going to please God. And folks, that's just flat out heresy. It was heresy 2,000 years ago, and it's heresy today. It's heresy any time and any place that it's ever taught. As a matter of fact, when you look at most of the cults of the world or religions that really go way off base, it usually can be tracked back to false teachings about the nature of Jesus. Now, Paul wrote this letter to attack these false teachings head on and to help believers understand that Jesus is enough. Several times in this uh, series, in the first two lessons, I mentioned a book by Tulian Shabajan called, and it's his series of sermons, frankly, on this, this particular letter. It's called, Jesus Plus Nothing Equals Everything. And I believe that's what Paul wanted them to know and he, what he wants us to know. It's not Jesus plus something else. It's Jesus plus nothing equals everything that we need. Now, we're not going to get to chapter 2 today in Colossians, but let me give you a little preview of what Paul's going to say in chapter 2. He's going to tell us that in Jesus Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Now, you see how he's confronting the false teaching? All the fullness of God dwells in bodily form in Jesus Christ, he's going to say. Paul's going to reject their worship of angels. He's going to reject their Jewish ceremonies. He's going to reject any notion that there has to be some sort of secret mystical knowledge in order to be saved. Indeed, in, in Jesus Christ, in chapter 2, Paul says, In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. They're in Him. Not someplace else. They're in Jesus. So with that refresher and with that brief glimpse into chapter 2, let's get back to where we left off then in Colossians chapter 1. Paul launches into his corrective teaching at verse 15. I want us to read through verse 20 so that we can get the context, but we're going to drill down today on just three verses. Verses 15, 16, and 17. Begin reading in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by Him and for Him. Now, as I go through, notice how many times Paul uses the word all. Verse 17. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through His blood shed on the cross. Now today as we zero in and drill down on verses 15, 16, and 7, Paul is going to say Jesus is supreme over all creation. Next week we'll come back and... Paul's going to talk about how he is supreme in other ways, but today we're going to focus on the creation. Look at the first part of verse 15 again. 
The Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. The word image here is an interesting one in the Greek language. It's the word icon. It means image or it means likeness. It's the word from which we get our English word that sounds exactly like it. Icon. Which is a reference in English to a statue. Have you ever heard of worshipping icons? It's worshipping statues. The idea of an icon or a statue is that you've got either out of stone or maybe wood or some other material, an image which is created to be a representation of another being in our city, in our nation, all over the world. Images are made, statues are made all the time. And it's amazing if you take a picture of, let's say, Winston Churchill, and then you look at a statue of Winston Churchill, how much that statue looks like the actual person. And that's the idea of a statue, isn't it? You want a statue to be a, as close a representation of the real person as possible. And that's the word here that Paul uses. Now, Paul is not saying that Jesus is a statue. What Paul is saying is that when you see Jesus, you see an exact representation of who God is. Exact. You know, when God created us, He created us in His image, in His likeness. We know that from Genesis chapters 1 and 2. We're like God in many, many ways, aren't we? We're like God in the sense that we have a distinct personality. Each of us possesses intellect. We have emotions. We have a will. God has all those things. We can think. We can feel. We can choose. And so in those ways, we are in the image of God. But we, as human beings, are not totally in the image of God because God is completely and totally holy, isn't He? You and I are not holy. We are sinful. And so in that sense, we are not completely in the image of God. We are human. God is divine. And so while we're made in God's image and His likeness, We're not totally made in His image and likeness because of our sin. But Jesus, on the other hand, is the perfect, complete, accurate image of God. Sinless, holy. He was God. He was man at the same time. He didn't become the image of God when He was born into this flesh, when He lived on earth. Jesus has been the image of God from the very beginning. See, you and I have a difficult time understanding the spirit world. We have a hard time understanding how God is spirit and that God does not have a physical body like you and I do. We cannot conceive of a being who has always existed, who always will exist, who has a spirit that never dies, who never gets hungry, who never gets sleepy, who never has to rest, who never gets sick. You see, as a spirit, God is invisible to the human eye, isn't He? And while that's hard for us to conceive of a spirit who does not have a physical body, God is spirit. We cannot see Him with the visible eye. But now here's one of your blanks to fill in. One of the reasons Jesus came to earth in the flesh was to give us a visible expression of the invisible God. Does that make sense? If Jesus is the perfect representation of God, if He is the image of God, we can't see God, so how are we supposed to know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. He's the exact representation of God. Of who the Father is. That's why in John chapter 14 verse 9, Jesus would say, Anyone who has seen me has seen who? The Father. Listen to the various translations that try to help us get at this, of this same verse. The message says, We look at the Son and see the God who cannot be seen. The Good News translation says, Christ is the visible likeness of the invisible God. The New Living Bible says He is the exact likeness of the unseen God. 
And Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. That's another interesting phrase there in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. When it says Jesus is the exact representation, that word is referring to an engraving tool in ancient times or to a stamp. It's sort of like at home I have a... Uh, a return address got my name and my home address on it. It's an inked stamp. It's self-inked. And so every time I push that thing down on an envelope, what do I get? I get exactly the same thing every time. No deviation. It's the same thing every time. And that's what the Hebrew writer is saying to us. Jesus is the exact representation of God. You look at Jesus, you see the same thing as if you could see God because that's what Jesus is like. He's the exact representation. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, that Jesus is in the very form of God. In Christ Jesus, the invisible God became visible. And in John chapter 1, verse 14, John writes this about Jesus. He says, And we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father. Now, why am I hammering on this so much? Because it's just as important for us today to understand the nature of Jesus as it was for these people in the first century. Folks, you have to get your theology about who Jesus is right or everything else gets messed up. Don't let anybody ever tell you that Jesus is somehow less than God. Jesus is the full final and complete revelation of God. He is both God and man. He is God in the flesh when he was here on this earth. Now, let's move on to see what Paul says in the last half of verse 15. He says, the Son is the firstborn over all creation. Now, what does that mean? The firstborn over all creation? Jehovah's Witnesses teach this verse or pull this verse and use it, they believe, as a proof text that Jesus was a created being. They teach that Jesus has not always existed and therefore Jesus is not divine. He's not deity. But they misunderstand the use of the word here and they certainly misrepresent this verse in light of the overall context. There's no way you can read this context and come out with that conclusion. While it is true that the Greek word that's found in this passage can mean the first child born chronologically. For instance, Jane and I have three children. Our firstborn was Mary Ann. Second born was Amy. Third born was Wesley. So, it, the word can be first, the first child born in our family would be Mary Ann. But the Bible didn't always use that word in that sense. Sometimes the firstborn child chronologically was not considered the firstborn child when it came to inheritance. Everybody in the ancient world would have known exactly what Paul was talking about here when he talked about the firstborn. Let me give you a couple of examples, even from the Old Testament. Do you remember the story of Esau and Jacob? Which one was born first? Esau. Which one received the inheritance? Jacob, the younger. And Jacob is referred to as the firstborn. He was not chronologically first, but he received the inheritance and therefore was referred to as the firstborn. If you know the story of King David and the children that were born to King David, was Solomon the first child born to David? No. And yet the Psalms refer to Solomon as the firstborn. Why? Because the inheritance went through Solomon and not David's firstborn child. Now here's what Paul means by saying that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. He's saying Jesus is of first importance. 
that Jesus is of first and highest rank. Jesus is the one who has a unique relationship with the Father. He has a relationship, one of honor, one of authority, one of dignity. Now, again, let me refer to three different translations or paraphrases that really try to help us get at what that verse is saying. The Good News Translation says, He is, talking about Jesus, superior to all created beings. The footnote in the New Living Bible says, He existed before God made anything. The New Century Version says, He ranks higher than everything that has been made. So when Paul says he's the firstborn of creation, he says Jesus is, has the place of preeminence. He's first. He's top. He has, the, he has the top rank of everything that exists. Now, next Paul's going to argue that Jesus is superior to everything in creation. Next week we'll look at things he's superior in other ways. But Paul here says he's superior to everything in creation. Look at verses 16 and 17 again. For in Him, Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Now, Paul develops his argument in these two verses by making three points. Point number one. The reason Jesus is superior to everything in creation is because He's the one who created it all. Jesus is not a created being. He created everything else. He's the source of everything that exists. Now here's where I need you to remember again part of the false teaching that was going on in Colossians. Those false teachers were saying that Jesus was the first emanation from God. In other words, He was the first thing that God created. And that there were several other beings below Jesus, down the rungs of the ladder, completely removed from God, who eventually created this evil material universe in which we live. And these Gnostics, these false teachers, believed that since all matter was evil, they denied that God's Son could have had anything at all to do with creation. And Paul adamantly, adamantly rejects that doctrine and declares that Jesus created all things. Now, his second argument is this. Jesus existed before there was a creation. Before the universe even came into existence, Paul says, Jesus was there. Think back with me to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Now, the Word, down in verse 14, who is the Word? It's Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God when? In the beginning. One day during his ministry, some critics came up to Jesus and asking him all kinds of questions. And Jesus answered them, before Abraham was, some of the translations add the word was born. Before Abraham was, I am. Now you English teachers would say that's not correct grammar. But that's not a mistake in the translation. See, I am is a present tense word. My name's Dan Dozier. I'm standing on the stage. I am. I am Dan. I'm here right now at this particular moment in time in history. And you're sitting where you are. You know, you can say, I am. Now, to say, I was, that's in the past, isn't it? Notice Jesus did not say, before Abraham, before Abraham I was. Now, he, he was, of course. But he's saying, before Abraham was, I am. In other words, I have always been here. I have always been present tense. Even before creation, long before Abraham came on the scene, I exist. Jesus wanted us to know he's always been here. See, Jesus 
existed with God the Father and God the Spirit. Jesus is not a created being. He Himself is the Creator of all things, both seen and unseen. The largest stars and galaxies of the universe, He made them. The smallest particles, so small that the human eye cannot even see them with the most powerful telescope, He made them. And here's Paul's third argument. In Christ, all things hold together. I love this phrase and where it's going to take us in just the next few minutes. In Christ, he he says, Jesus created everything. And Jesus holds it all together. Let's talk about the universe for a moment. And first, let's talk about the parts of our universe that are so small that not even the most powerful telescopes can begin to see those things. It's the world of atoms and molecules. Those of you who are younger probably have studied atoms and molecules in school recently. But those of us who are older may need a little bit of a refresher course. You remember studying atoms and molecules in school? See, everything around us, everything from the hair on your head to the seat that you're sitting on, to the clothes that you're wearing this morning, to the airplanes that move through the sky. Everything in existence is made up of atoms and molecules. I went to a source online called explainthatstuff.com. New one to me. I needed a refresher myself on on atomic uh, ideas. And uh, this was kind of written, I think, at a level even I can understand it. Let me just read this to you. ExplainThatStuff.com says, Most atoms have three different subatomic particles inside. And you can see a picture of the atom. You've seen those before. Those particles are protons, neutrons, and electrons. The protons and neutrons are packed together into the center of the atom, which is called the nucleus. And the electrons, which are very much smaller, whiz around the outside. When people draw pictures of atoms, like what you see on the screen, they show the electrons like satellites spinning around the Earth in orbits. In fact, electrons move so quickly that we never know exactly where they are from one moment to the next. Imagine them as super-fast racing cars moving so incredibly quickly that they turn into blurry clouds. They almost seem to be everywhere at once. Now, where are we going with this? Nuclear physicists, I can barely say the word, much understand what nuclear physicists do. But nuclear physicists understand how molecules and atoms work, except for one thing. They cannot explain what holds the atom together. They have no clue. They want to know. They'd like to be able to explain it. But they cannot understand why an atom doesn't just fly apart. By all human logic, it should just explode. So for the atheistic scientist, all he can do is scratch his head and shrug because he simply cannot explain why the atom doesn't fly apart. But you and I know why it doesn't fly apart, don't we? Because Jesus holds it together. Jesus knows and understands every law of science and physics, not because he's gone to school to learn about it, but because Jesus invented and created every law of science and physics. And he maintains it, he sustains it, he holds it together. Now, let's move from the world of the invisible to the outer reaches of outer space. Gravity and the magnetic fields of space work because that's the way Jesus designed them to work. And He is the maintainer of all this vast universe. If we can refer to all this out there in the universe as heavenly machinery, then the heavenly machinery moves with such incredible mathematical precision that we can foretell centuries in advance the occasion of an eclipse or the visit of a comet 
We can launch a spacecraft that takes years to reach its destination and hit that destination because of the mathematical precision of the way the universe operates. I want to close again by reading to you things. This is beyond my knowledge, so I have to rely on other people. But I found this to be so incredibly inspiring to me this week. This is from Kevin DeYoung's blog that appeared just back in February of this year. I'm going to read this kind of slowly because there's a lot of pictures here. I want you to just kind of keep your eyes on the screen. Don't watch me. Just watch the screen. It just just amazes me. The young writes, We can scarcely imagine the galactic grandeur of God. Our sun is a mere 93 million miles from earth. If the earth were the size of a grapefruit, the moon would be a ping pong ball about 12 feet away. The sun would be a ball of fire as big as a four-story building a mile away, and Pluto, an invisible marble, 37 miles out. If we wanted to travel to the sun and we went in an airplane going 500 miles an hour, which is about what a jet airplane travels, it would take us 21 years to get to the sun. If we went to Pluto we would be in the airplane for more than 900 years. If we flew on the same plane to the nearest group of stars, Alpha Centauri, only 4.3 light years away, at a speed of 500 miles an hour, it would take us 6 million years to get there. By comparison, the nearest galaxy to the Milky Way, which is the galaxy we're a part of, it's the Andromeda galaxy, that's 2.5 million light years away, or 15 quintillion miles. That's 15 with 18 zeros after it. Our trip to Andromeda by plane would take us 4.2 trillion years. As of a few years ago, the farthest galaxy the Hubble telescope had been able to detect was 13 billion light years from Earth. That's 78 sextillion miles away, 78 with 21 zeros after it. It would take us 20 quadrillion years to get there by flying in our 500 mile an hour airplane. And note this. And this isn't empty space. The universe is full of stars. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, has between 150 and 200 billion stars. And the Milky Way is just one of 150 million, or no, 150 billion galaxies. Are you starting to feel a little small? Just a little He says, there are more stars in the galaxy of the universe than grains of sand on the seashore. And yet Psalm 147 verse 4 says, God determines the number of the stars and He gives to all of them their names. Truly, as the writer of Psalm 19.1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And then to end off his little piece, he goes back to the world of the molecular and the subatomic, the world that we can't see. I hope all of this has made an impression on you, but listen to this. And to boggle the mind on a molecular level, consider the number of stars in the universe. None of us can conceive how many stars that is, right? But he says the number of stars in the universe is a smaller number than the number of H2O molecules in ten drops of water. Now the Apostle Paul didn't know all of this. He didn't have all these facts 2,000 years ago. But Paul knew even then that this world and this universe, 
in which we live is massive and complicated. And he knew that something, more precisely, he knew that someone was holding it all together. He was inspired by the Spirit to know that. And so Paul is wanting us to know, folks, if some cult tries to teach you that Jesus is not God, that He's lesser than God, that He's somehow a created being, you go to Colossians chapter 1 and you say, that's not what I see in Colossians chapter 1. And the, here's the thing for us this morning as we close. This one, Jesus, who had all the creative power to create this universe, who has all the sustaining and maintaining power to hold it all together, is the same one who took on human flesh and came to this earth and lived as one of us to die in our place to pay the penalty for our sin so that we could be forgiven and have a forever relationship with Him forever. Now that's really mind-boggling. And yet that's what the gospel teaches. And this morning, if you have never said yes to Jesus, if you have never confessed your faith in Him and repented of sins and been buried with Him in baptism to begin your walk with Him, He invites you to do that this morning. There's no one else like Him. He's superior to everything and everyone else. He is the one and only. This morning, if you need to come for any reason, come right now. Let's stand. Let's sing together.